Welcome to the Integrated Schools Podcast. I'm Andrew, a white dad from Denver. I'm Val, a black mom from North Carolina. And this is a framework for anti-racist education. Val, this is one, I mean, I guess I say this every week. I'm excited for this episode, but I'm really (laughs) excited for this conversation today. And not least of which, because for the past 10 episodes now, you have been showing up as Val, a black mom from North Carolina, and you've been doing an amazing job. It has been awesome to have you. Thank you. But you also do have a job that is not this podcast. I do. The job that I'm quite often distracting you from. All good. All good. (laughs) You get to show up and and talk about that work today at the Center for Anti-Racist Education. You want to tell us about it? Yeah. So I'm the academic director for the Center for Anti-Racist Education, also called CARE. And we had a chance to talk about some work that we're doing with one of my favorite humans on earth, Brittany, a Black woman from Wisconsin. She is very much from Wisconsin. I love it. Mm, Yes. Brittany is awesome. You have collected a number of fine folks over there at CARE. Oh, man. So good. So our goal is to equip anti-racist educators with the knowledge and skills that they need to do the work and the curriculum to help them do it well. Yeah. And how long have you been at CARE? It's been a little over a year now that we've been setting the foundation for this work. And uh, we're really excited that we have things to share with the world that are really resonating with people. Things like this framework that we'll hear about it in the episode. It's a powerful tool that I think lots of educators are finding use in. And I, I think also, I mean, I, I, as not an educator, found a lot of use in it as well. So hopefully folks will download it and spread it around. That is my and our hope, because really this work is about creating an anti-racist future that we can all thrive in. And, you know, we've talked about that before. Those are our goals here as well. So I think it's a nice fit. Yep. You never get a break from this, Val. Ah, <laughs> it's all, it's all this work all the time. <laughs> I don't get a break, but I'm trying to find a hobby. That's That should yeah. be part of our outro next time. <laughs> How's my All hobby right. going? We'll be checking in on your hobby. Yeah. All right. Let's take a listen. I am Brittany Brassel. I am a Wisconsin Living Wisconsin, loving it, tundra, winter. Oh my gosh. I'm a mother of two, happily married. I work for the Center for Anti Racist Education as a professional development specialist with Val, my awesome supervisor. That's great. I love that when you said Wisconsin, you really like leaned into the Wisconsin accent. <laughs> it's thick. <laughs> well, I love it because at this point, when I read messages or emails, I say it in your voice. It's <laughs> I love it. It's my favorite part. It's it's thick. I tr- I try to hide it sometimes, and then I'm like, I, there's no hiding that. Like, no, there is no in. hiding. Mm-mm. Just go That's go great. with it. Just go with yeah. it. Yeah. Here we'll talk about care in a minute. But how'd you find yourself engaged in anti-racist education work? What what in your background brought you here? Yeah. So I decided to become a teacher pretty late in the game in terms of. Teachers usually know they want to be teachers at a really young age, and I was not that person. Um, I almost didn't even graduate high school. So for me to then get into education, I definitely got into it with the mindset that I'm going to be that teacher I wish I had. Like, I Mm. want to be that kind of rebel kind of teacher that can engage with kids and understand kids because all kids are going through something. So I wanted to be that educator. Um, So as I was going through my teaching courses, you started to kind of hear culturally responsive teaching and equity started to kind of creep in there. But nobody really said anti-racist or Mm. anti-racist education. So I didn't have that language or really that framework until I was probably two, three years in where one day I was kind of sitting and I was like, what? We're just being (laughs) anti-racist. Why, why, why can't we use that word? Why is nobody using that word? And so from there, I really decided to just go hard. And I started with just learning history, reading books. Then I found Clear the Air on Twitter, which Val, you know, is a superstar Mm -hmm. of that. So I found my community. Um, So it was really like this perfect alignment of the stars of me kind of learning my history, finding a community that I could engage with professionally. And then I really started to just focus on myself and who I wanted to be as a teacher and kind of started unpacking my upbringing and why I hated school and how did I then become a teacher? Right. So it was kind of a two-year period of just 
learning and growth before I finally was like, wait a second, I'm an anti-racist educator. I am a social justice, anti-racist educator champion, and I'm going to own it. And then Mm. from there, I was just trying to get anybody who would listen to me, who want to learn with me. And it kind of just stuck. Now, Now I'm in it. That's great. I'm so lucky, Andrew. (laughs) <laughs> Obviously. I really Obviously. am. I really, really am. Can, can you say a little more about what it was like as you were unpacking those things in your background that made you hate school, that made you feel like disconnected from that? Oh, yeah. What were some of those things and how have you sort of tried to push back against that? Yeah. So in my community, when I was going to school, we were probably in 90, 10 percent district. So 90 percent white, 10 percent other, if you will. So I always felt different. I always felt like an outlier. I always felt like I wasn't supposed to be there. Mm. And my sophomore year of high school, we have counselor meetings where they're essentially, you meet with your counselor, you start planning your future. And I had never really thought about my future. I'm a sophomore, you know, I got, I just got my license. Like I'm trying to enjoy life. Right. Uh, but my counselor brought me in and very openly said, you know, I don't think you're college material, so let's look at kind of these trades. I was like, trades? What? No, I want to go to college, I think. But to hear those words out loud from an adult who is supposed to help me kind of prepare for that part of my life, I shut off. I was done. That was that was my tipping point. I was like, well, then why... If I'm not college material, then why am I going to school? <laughs> why finish um, high school? That's yeah. a great... I mean, mm. very honest reflection, right? One hundred percent. And I and I was I was just done with it. And I was not a bad student. You know, I am thankful that I kind of learned the system. Okay, if you have to do my homework and if I kind of study for a test and pull B's and C's, I'll be all right. I enjoyed learning. I really loved history, it was kind of my subject. But after hearing that, oh, I was done. And I just attended school socially for the rest of the year. But by senior year, I was done. Like, I think, gosh, I would love to pull up those attendance reports for my (laughs) senior year. (laughs) They are bad. They are bad. I I do remember my mom sitting me down one night, like, you're going to have to go to court for truancy. Wow. I never heard that. Yeah. I mean, I was not going to school. (laughs) I was like, I don't, I don't need you anymore. And I figured I'll I'll get a job in retail, I'll make some cash, I'll move out, and I'll just live my life. And so I had, gosh, probably three three years outside of graduating. And then I finally was like, wait a second, I need an education. Like, I got to mm. get a real job. I can't mm. work retail for the rest of my life. You didn't name this in your story with the guidance counselor. And just for the listeners, do you think your racial identity had anything to do with how she saw you and your potential? I've thought about it a lot. And up to that point, there really was no indicator academically that I couldn't make it in college. I was a basketball player. I was heavily involved with our music program. You know, I was pulling B's and C's. So there was really no reason to suspect. So yeah, I do think racially, especially at that time, I mean, I could tell you who the Black kids were in my class. We didn't have a large Hispanic population at that point. We didn't have a large Asian population. So it was very much white and black. So I I think about it. I, you know, she never said like, hey, I'm racist today. (laughs) (laughs) They don't usually. (laughs) You know. Unfortunately, Um, they don't usually. Exactly. I wish it would make things easier. (laughs) Gosh. But but yeah, I do I do think about that. What other indicator besides my race could have led you, a school counselor, to say, you're not college material. Hmm. I don't know. It's tough. What was that moment when you decided, okay, I actually need to go back? And like, what was the yes. transformation that pushed you back into schooling? The turning point was I became a mother. I became hmm. a mother and looked at my son and was like, um, this retail electronics job is not going to give you the life that I want you to have. Hmm. And so I immediately enrolled in a program. I went down the history route and I was like, you know what? I could be, I could be a history teacher. I could be a teacher. Hey, I could be, I could be, you know, the teacher that would have helped me and, you know, taught me all these things and opened my eyes to all of these things. Right. I really did want to be, I wanted to be the teacher that I wanted hmm. as I was going through high school. That's beautiful. Isn't it? 
Oh. And so that took you to CARE, Val. Can sort of give us a little overview of what CARE is. Yeah, so the Center for Anti-Racist Education, our mission is to equip anti-racist educators and advance anti-racist curriculum. And we understand that the two go hand in hand. So even if we give you the best book, some of the books that we've talked about on the podcast, there's still a lot of damage you can do (laughs) if you Mm -hmm. are not equipped as an educator to have these conversations around race and racism. And so while we definitely believe it's important to talk about these things. We also believe it's important for the adults who are having these conversations to go through their own process of being prepared for them, right? Because what we don't want is for additional harm to be caused in having these conversations. And so in 2020, obviously there was a lot of activity nationally and globally around racial justice and anti-racist support. And so we were like, how can we contribute to the conversation in a way that makes Learning how to be an anti-racist educator, a really tangible, applicable, I can, I know how to take the steps to do it. That's the work we have attempted to do. Yeah. And so that's how this CARE framework came to be. Right. So we started with five principles, right? Because again, and to Brittany's point, you know, there's lots of words that are out there for anti-racism and it's still one of those words where people don't actually know what that means. And so we started with those five principles, something that we wanted people to be able to remember and like list off. So let's hear them. What are the five principles? In the research for the principles, we found a lot of examples currently that we think fall on our first principle, affirm the dignity and humanity of all people, right? So it's a lot about caring for students, belonging. So our first principle is affirming the dignity and humanity of all people. The next one, we recognize that people don't know a whole lot of our nation's history or our world's history around race. And so embracing those historical truths, which, you know, as you can tell right now in our country, we're having a difficult time wanting to do that. And there's there's efforts to keep us from doing that. And so embracing those historical truths will help us, you know, just be honest about our past so that we can move forward. And then that third one, that developing that critical consciousness, I think that's a lot of what we do on the podcast, where you and I are talking through some things and learning how to to see the world from each other's perspectives and just really Mm -hmm. thinking through that, right? And I think that is a skill that as you develop it, you can't turn that one off, right? So you're looking at everything differently in the world, and that's what we want young people to do. That fourth one, recognize race and confront racism, We recognize in schools, especially, there's a hesitancy to name race. And there's also a hesitancy, for whatever reason, to to confront racism. And I can't figure out why. Because I think that, you know, we've all decided in history that racism is bad. I think we've decided that. But for whatever reason, it's difficult. I think, right? I know. That was like a... mm. (laughs) I would like to think so. Some people definitely have. I I think we've decided racism is bad. At least we're trying to fix it on this podcast. And we will by the end of this episode. But... No pressure, Brittany. No pressure. No pressure, Brittany. (laughs) We ask the guests to fix racism while they're here. We got it. We got it. (laughs) And so recognizing race and confronting racism is something that, although seems pretty simple, is not something folks regularly do, including Mm -hmm. educators, right? Mm -hmm. And as we get people uh, more comfortable with normalizing conversations about race and confronting the racism, we hope that we'll speed up this process to our anti-racist future. And then, of course, creating just systems, right? Really thinking about how the whole system functions. And I think that's also a lot of the work of integrated schools, like how to push on the system to make sure that it is the place that we want for all of our kids to go to school. So... So those are the foundational points, and I think they will stand the test of time. And I think there's something that people can get behind. Yeah. Shared humanity, historical truths, critical consciousness, race and racism, and just systems. And those are kind of these these five pillars that then this framework that you created kind of helps educators, school leaders, principals figure out, how do I look at these and say, okay, these are important, now what? Right. So what do I do now that I recognize, yes, I want to affirm someone's humanity. Here are the skills, behaviors that you can do to help reach those goals. Yeah. Brittany, what of those, I mean, they're not, they're not hierarchical. It's not like you do one right. and then you graduate to the next. You have to kind of be doing them, them all at the same time. But was there, there one of those principles that stuck out more to you or felt kind of resonated more with you in your experience? Yeah, I think, you know, the the biased history buff in me gravitates towards historical truth. Mm -hmm. I'm really a firm believer in in getting that context and that foundation. Because as Val said, we we just really do not know our history. 
We know parts of it. We know kind of big highlights, but in terms of kind of the nitty gritty to how we got to those highlights, we don't know. It's it's hidden. Yeah. So I gravitated towards that. But then I also gravitate towards critical consciousness because you really do, when you start to work on how to see things, what you're looking for, and really kind of tying that into who you are as a person, it just changes your whole life. I mean, I can't even watch TV without looking at commercials and right. being like, did you see that? Did you just see what they did there? Like, yeah. who, who's their diversity team? Come on. You Absolutely. Know? And so, Absolutely. Right? Yeah. You're like, how does this so, get on TV? No. There is not right. one black person on your staff, seriously? No, right. <laughs> not one. Like, <laughs> how many people saw this before it aired? So, yeah. so that one is really impactful just because it really changes just the way you walk, think, speak. And it's really cool because once that light bulb turns on, well, you can't shut it off. You yeah, cannot totally. turn it off. It's so yeah. cool. I want to go back to the historical truth bit because I, one of the things that I, I appreciated in the framework is this idea of balancing stories of oppression with those of agency, resistance, and perseverance. There's sort of the, the first step is like, okay, let's actually tell the story of how brutal slavery was. But if that's all we ever tell, then the story is kind of all woe is black people mm-hmm. and they have only been victims. Can you speak to that, telling the other side of that a bit? Yeah, 100%. I think... When I started my deep dig into just learning American history, oh, I was angry. <laughs> I was so upset because, and, and I'll be the first to admit this, when I found out and learned who James Baldwin was, was very late, very late in my years. And when you learn and you read his words and you realize that that was kept from you or hidden and I didn't have access to that and an age when I needed to have access to that, mm-hmm. oh, it just, it just gets my blood boiling. And then I start to think, and I have all these memories of sitting in history class. And, okay, you know slavery's coming up. Mm-hmm. You know the civil rights movement's coming up. And in my case, you know, being one of few Black students in the classroom, you just get this feeling of just dread and angst. And it, mm. and it just sucks because, you know, as soon as they say the word Black or African American or slavery— you just hear chairs creak, you know, mm-hmm, you just hear mm-hmm. papers shuffle and people start looking at you because they they also don't have access to the history. And so they're going to look for that one reference. Oh, the black kid in the back. So it's just a tension building awful moment. And it can be solved by just presenting all of the sides, the good, mm. the bad and the ugly. You know, if I would have learned about slavery alongside Frederick Douglass, that's a totally different experience for every kid in that class. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I really appreciate the fact that we, we've highlighted, yeah, you're going to have to talk about some ugly and dark things, but a lot of really beautiful, good, just amazing examples were happening at that same time. So put them together. Like, what, what harm is that going to do to share the good and the bad together? Mm-hmm. To your point, Brittany, what a difference it would have, I think, also made as a student to learn more about the collective action that people took across racial lines, right? And so I think part Mm -hmm. of the issue, and Andrea, I would like you to speak for all white people, um, but, but (laughs) but part of the issue is like, I think black folks in that situation that you described are sitting with shame, you know, and white folks are sitting with guilt, right? And not figuring out how to have that conversation together where we know since the inception of slavery, there have been people who opposed it. And there have been people who opposed it of different racial identities, right? So why don't we know those stories? And how much more yeah. empowering would those stories be? And how much further along in our journey would we be if those were the conversations that we had about these very terrible things? There were some terrible things and there were people always fighting against those terrible things. I think it would make a huge difference for white people who are fearful of having the conversation if they knew part of the conversation also included there are people who work together to oppose all of these bad things that you hear about. Yeah, I, that 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 piece feels so important to me and and like such a a tricky line to walk because on the one hand, 
like I feel it tends to be like, oh no, no, like not like not all white people. Like don't associate me with that and kind of like I'm not one of them, which uh absolves me of my own role right now in pushing back on these systems in some ways. But then it feels like we are asking white people to come up brand new today with a new way to be white people. And we actually don't need to do that, right? There are historical examples. Like the abolitionist movement was full of white people. There were white people who are deeply committed to these ideas. If we can tell those stories as well, then it's sort of there's like a we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. We are trying to tap into something that has been part of some strands of white culture all along. And how do we kind of pull those b- bits out without ignoring the harm that so many white people do without pretending that there's not some obligation to white people now to try to push the ball forward, but that we're not doing it in a vacuum or we're not trying to come up with it brand new right now. I think you're exactly right. And I and I wonder how many white people know the name of a white abolitionist that they are like, yeah, I want to be just like Frederick Douglass, <laughs> you know, Harriet Tubman. Like, can white people name those people, right? And just the power of being able to have, like you said, that specific example, the historical example of here is someone who I am inspired by and is doing the work. Did you know that there was a white guy at the March on Washington out there lighting it up? I think it's Walter Ruther. And he says, there's a lot of talk about brotherhood. And then some Americans drop the brother and keep the hood. Walter was not playing. Walter Walter was not playing. So get you some Walter. Get you some Walter. Yep, it's good stuff. There are, especially during, you know, 40s, 50s, and 60s, there are white abolitionists out there that were doing the work without fear. And they were empowered to do the work. And I think... As a kid in a classroom, like, I want my students to feel that. I I desperately tried to create that environment where my entire class could engage in these conversations because oftentimes this is their first experience with it. And how cool is it to have, you know, totally integrated classroom of kids from different backgrounds and experiences and knowledges just questioning and sharing and learning I mean, think that's what all teachers want is that kind of magic that can happen. And that comes from being intentional about balancing kind of that oppression and that power. Yeah. I mean, white people have been plenty centered in historical narratives. We don't want to like refocus the civil rights movement on white people, but not ever holding out those. Like, like I can't think of, I don't have a name. Val. I'm thinking about that. I don't have a name. And I feel like that's a problem. I got I got some homework to do. Yeah. Because I'm here for the solidarity. I really am. So we got to figure out how to do this together. Yeah, but we don't have to figure out from scratch. I mean, that's the... Exactly. Yeah. Let's talk about some of these other principles, maybe dig in a little more. You know, thinking about the value and possibility in all students. Why does that need to be one of these core principles? Yeah, I mean, I'll take you back to my counselor. If my counselor had this framework in, you know, 2000, whatever it was, you would have seen me as a valuable person, as a human, a thinking, learning child, you know, 15, 16 years old during that conversation. And I just think sometimes we forget in classrooms that every student really, truly is a gift. They are walking through that door, bringing their best self in that moment. And we should be tapping into that. I would have conversations with colleagues and just kind of get emotional Once these kids graduate, they could close their social circles if they want. Never again, if they choose to be in integrated spaces, they can say, you know what, I've done that. I did my K-12 years. I'm done. And they could really close off and isolate. And then what? That's going to help absolutely nothing. And so there really is magic in that classroom. But we have to make sure that every single student is looked at and thought of as the best You know, let them kind of just come in as themselves. And that does not happen often. That is not the majority of experiences in classrooms across this nation. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about race and racism, naming race and racism in the classroom. How does that play out? Why is it important? And I guess they all sort of blend together. But how do you differentiate that in your minds between creating just systems and naming race and racism? Are those they feel closely related to Uh. me, but maybe I'm missing something. Yeah, I think for me, they kind of all feed into creating just systems. Like if we are doing the things that come before that one, you can't help but create a just system. Because if you actually affirm Mm. the dignity and humanity of someone, then 
that would be a just system that you would want to have for them. Right. About the, the race situation, I think something that we have to remember, and I can't remember who said this exactly, but as educators, we are the adults in the room, right? And so it's very easy for us to model talking and grappling with our own understanding of race and racism in a way that young people may not, right? And so Mm -hmm. how do we start to normalize that? And so even if we're reading a text or, you know, if we're studying a historical figure or there's something in the news, right? We're like, man, from my perspective as a Black woman, here's what I'm thinking. Here's how I've seen the world. Here's how it connects to my experience. And so even beginning to normalize that, I think, goes a long way in just recognizing that we all have a racialized experience. And it's not going to be the same experience. I think sometimes there can be feelings of frustration among students when another student doesn't understand their experience just because they haven't lived it. And until we start talking about that, we won't ever know. And so how do we how do we normalize that? How do we have those conversations? And I think as the adult in the room, the educator can absolutely model what that looks like. Is there some tension in that? I feel like maybe I have an overly simplified view of what teaching is, but, you know, on some level as the teacher, you are there to be the expert. You are there Mm -hmm. to share the truth, to be the, the voice that knows what is what. And it feels like there's some tension between that Mm -hmm. role and the role of acknowledging that there are different experiences that here is my one experience and you might have another experience and those Mm -hmm. are also valid you know, how do, you, how do you think about holding both of those things at once? You triggered me with my teaching experience because <laughs> there are kind of two lanes of teachers. There are some teachers who really do truly, I'm the expert. I know it. I've been doing this for however many years. And then there are teachers that are, I'm not the expert. I'm here to learn with all of you. And so I think, I think you're right. I think there are some teachers that, that want to hold on to that kind of expertise so I think you just have to kind of grapple with what kind of teacher you're going to be. And and really, as parents also, who would you rather have your student learn from? Somebody that's kind of guiding and learning with your student as more of a mentor, really, or somebody who's going to just throw all of this content knowledge at them. So I enter in these classroom spaces knowing that historically Black woman perspectives have been minimized Anyway, so the Mm -hmm. idea that anyone would accept what I said as complete truth never even crossed my mind. (laughs) Like, you know, so and I don't you know, I don't I don't know, Brittany, I, I, I agree with everything you said. And I'm wondering, I'm just processing now, like, did I approach teaching as we're learning together Versus here's my knowledge because of my positionality as a black woman and people are going to question my version of the story. You know, I don't I don't know. But I think that that's some of it. I never approach teaching like I have all the I have all the knowledge and you have nothing to contribute. So I don't know if it's a simplified understanding of teaching, but I would love for more teachers to adopt the idea that our young people have something valuable to offer and make room for their voices in the curriculum and in conversations. And I think those that type of action goes a long way in creating the anti-racist system that we want, right? Say more about that, the connection between that. Yeah. So for me, that goes right into um, affirming dignity and humanity of all people. And it goes right right into creating a just system. And it goes right into developing a critical consciousness, right? So I see a, a student who might be considered an outsider or marginalized. I am elevating their voice in the classroom because I am showing the other students in the class their voice matters as much as everyone mm. else's voice. And so now mm-hmm. I am acting in a way, right? That, that demonstrates that and my system has changed and it's it's forcing the other students to be like, hey, I might have overlooked XYZ marginalized person before, but I have mm. a student in my class who always has something good to say and the teacher is always encouraging them. And so now when I go out into the world and I see a person that looks like that, I am not automatically right. assuming that they don't have anything to contribute. So I think they're really simple actions, I I do. Like, I don't think anything that we have put into this framework is so out of reach that every educator can't do. It really makes me wonder (laughs) why this is not done yet. Yeah. If every kid who shows up in your building, in your classroom, has humanity and has something to offer, and you can create a system that that acknowledges that, then everybody benefits. and, And the system becomes more just. Absolutely. 
We don't have anybody pushed out to the outside. We don't have school within schools. We don't have some schools right. having more resources than the others. Yeah, I've, the principal at my kids' school talks a lot about like teaching as as like facilitating learning. Mm-hmm. What the teacher's job is is to actually just facilitate the learning, and that you're building their skills and you're building their competencies and their ability to engage in conversation and productive dialogue and mm-hmm. learn how to research and do all these things. But the the kind of direct transfer of knowledge, the like filling up their little empty brains with your facts is not so much what's important. Right. And I'm glad you asked that question as a parent. I really am because a parent who isn't a teacher, like most of the parents I know are also educators, right? So right. I don't know what parents who aren't educators think should happen in school. So that was really illuminating for me. But yeah, that ability ability to engage in it as a a learner with your students. I mean, that that makes perfect sense to me. And it's certainly not the vision that I have of any of the teachers that I had growing up. That was not the model that I was exposed to. And I think we often assume that schools are exactly the way they were when we were growing up. You know, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. nothing has mm-hmm. changed in education. Yes. And I see a yes. lot of conflict arising among parents in classrooms and stuff like, well, where's the worksheet we're supposed to be working on? Or this new math doesn't make any sense to me. And it's like, yeah, like teaching is not happening. Fortunately, is not happening the same way it was mm-hmm. 20, 30, 40 years ago because the profession has grown. Right? That's it. Yeah, that's it. Because we have Brittany say, like, I'm going to be the teacher that I need it. Right. 100%. Mm-hmm. 100%. I would love for parents to read the framework and be like, I don't want my teacher to do this. You know, like every component, every indicator that is in that framework, I would hope parents would read that and go, if my child's teacher was doing even half of these things, wow, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know they're in good hands. Mm -hmm. You know, we're we're not out here to (laughs) harm kids. that's That's not our intention. The system we work in, was created to harm kids. Some kids. Yeah, the system, the the entire education system is and has been set up to only allow a certain small percentage of students to thrive and survive. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess, yeah, maybe to like push back on myself. I mean, I do think actually it is actually har- harming all kids. It is clearly not harming all kids equally. But even those kids that the system is setting up to quote unquote thrive are not thriving the way they could if everybody's humanity was being recognized, if everybody was learning historical truths, if everybody was developing that critical consciousness yeah. and, you know, naming race and racism and thinking about just systems, that actually benefits all of our kids. Like, my kids mm-hmm. are much better off for all the ways that these things are happening in the building that they are in right now and would not be as well situated to, you know, be contributing positive members of society if if they were in a space where they were just getting the resources and the attention that only the privileged white kids get to kind of mm-hmm. set them up to quote unquote thrive. Absolutely. I'm reading the framework again, and I'm still so thankful to the group who helped author this. But, you know, and thinking about a parent reading this, selects materials and resources that positively reflect the identities of students, families, and the community. There's nothing to be mad about with that, <laughs> right? right? Continuously evaluates and adjusts practices to better ensure that all students feel safe, welcomed, and valued. Uses questioning strategies to develop student thinking and analysis skills, right? Like, there's nothing (laughs) evil or harmful in any of these because our vision of an anti-racist future is one where everyone has everything that they need. And, yeah, I I hope parents do read it and do start asking questions about how to make these realities possible for the schools in which they send their kids. Like... I just wish and pray more parents would show up at a school board meeting. You know, teachers, we we have some power to change systems in a district, but really that comes from the community. That comes from families. That comes from parents being involved, showing up at meetings, questioning, you know, district leadership. In terms of real, true system change, it has to come from parents. I think, to your point, Brittany, one of the reasons why they don't know to do that is because they are still developing their critical consciousness, which I think is the power of integrated schools and this podcast and the, the book studies, right? Like this is active critical consciousness development that is happening. Mm-hmm. And so pat yourself on the back because <laughs> it's like, this is part of the work, right? We're definitely modeling analytical thinking. We're definitely building in meaningful conversations for us to understand power systems, each other, like the work is happening here. That's the only reason why I say yes. (laughs) 
it's true. We don't work where there's no work. Absolutely right. not. Absolutely not. Yeah, you in the sort of opening, you encourage school leaders to engage caregivers and community members with the framework and be transparent about your goals for an anti-racist school. H- how have you seen that play out in ways that are helpful? And what can parents do to, to show up for that, to support that, to give the school leaders the kind of positive reinforcement and encouragement to keep doing that? I think for me in my community around here, we had about a year where equity was kind of the code word for race and anti-racism, social justice work. You know, it was all lumped into, oh, well, our our school's doing equity work. But what does that mean? And I I would love for parents to really start to question that. Well, what, what exactly do you mean by equity work? You're having your staff go through equity professional learning, but what are they actually learning about? Mm -hmm. Um, And if you don't hear anti-racism, speak up, say it, say, I want my teachers to be anti-racist. I want my students to have an anti-racist teacher. I think we just need to get more empowered with the use of that word. It's still very scary mm. for a lot of people, which I I struggle with. Like we're anti-racist. I you know, like what is my board? We should be able to agree <laughs> I just on that. Don't get it. <laughs> yeah. But you know, get get a little forceful because district leaderships oftentimes will gauge the politics within the community. The community feels like they're going one way. They'll kind of side with the community because mm-hmm. the community holds the power. Parents right. hold the power. Especially white parents. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. especially white parents. So get a little bold. I think if you brought me to an open house and you said, hey, we're really looking at this anti-racist framework, parents. Love for you to start asking questions about it, looking into it. Which one really stands out to you? How, you know, can we collaborate on ways to support this for our children together? That would make a huge difference. So I say be as transparent as possible. I can't think of anything in here that needs to be hidden. Just take it in. (laughs) Bring the parent conferences. (laughs) Like, hey, I I read this really cool. Have you seen this? Have you seen this framework? Shovel, you know, all of that. (laughs) Can I ask you something, Brittany, about what you just said about about parents kind of showing up and demanding? Um, I think there is also a tendency for the liberal white parent who just like read white fragility for the first time to be like, oh, I've got all the answers and this is what the school needs to do and kind of march in, particularly if we're thinking about, you know, parents who are, you know, a small handful of white parents in an otherwise largely black and brown school. How do you think about kind of tempering that to be supportive without trying to dominate or take over the conversation, which is something that is not necessarily a white parent's forte? Yes. Well, I'm a firm believer and practitioner of stay in your lane philosophy. (laughs) So make sure you know what your lane is. Um, You don't want to overstep. And it's like, get get out and make some friends. Make some Mm -hmm. other friends with other parents. If our kids can go in the classroom and integrate and, you know, have magical moments all day, then the parents waiting to pick up can do the same thing. And so from there, you can start to build those coalitions. And so then you don't go in there demanding. You come in with a group and then it doesn't seem so out of balance, if you will. Yeah, for sure. The importance of community, of showing up and getting into community and then figuring out how to advocate. But in the meantime, I do think there is a role, you know, even even before you've built that community, when you see a teacher or a school leader trying some of this to, to just be like, yo, I'm here for that. Yeah. Keep right. up the good work. Thank That's you. It. That's it. I support that. Yeah. Listen, teachers read their emails. <laughs> it right. is, it's a myth that we don't. We read them. <laughs> we read every word. Send an email like, wow, I saw that, you know, little Johnny came home and was learning whatever. Send that teacher a little one sentence message that says, really, mm-hmm. thank you for opening little Johnny's eyes to Frederick Douglass. You know, <laughs> I don't know. Right. But, but send that thank you. Andrew, I always appreciate you reminding me how whiteness might operate in these spaces. But I'm like, yeah, go do it. You're like, but wait, Val, wait, you actually... <laughs> Slow down. You actually Slow don't down. want that. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah. I mean, you do. And like yeah. you said, like with critical critical consciousness, as soon as you start seeing it, you see it everywhere. Yeah. And you see it in your school and you're like, I got to do something about this. But, you know, being one step ahead on the journey, there's still a long journey right. ahead. And so it's like, right, oh, right. hang on. Right. Let me like come to understand things a little better. And that, I think that's where that, to yeah. your point, Brittany, the community piece is so important because... If you've made friends with 10, 10 parents at pickup and they're all like kind of feeling some kind of way that my kid hasn't learned anything about Frederick Douglass, 
Mm-hmm. Then when all 10 of you show up and you're like, hey, we'd really like to learn about Frederick Douglass, it's really hard for the for the school to ignore that. Oh, but there will be a school-wide email out that night. <laughs> These parents came in hot. I mean, right. that, so you want to talk about power and change in systems. It's right there. It is yeah. literally just, hey, get out at pickup. So uh, to, just to, to kind of wrap up here, I think, the, I mean, the framework is amazing. I'm, it's so awesome that it is out there, that is digestible, actionable. You don't have to have a degree in anything really to read it. It is perfectly understandable for even a parent like myself who doesn't really know anything about teaching. It feels like if I was a teacher, I would be like, okay, I could start with one of those things. Like that doesn't feel overwhelming. But the other thing that I took away from reading the whole thing is it, like it is it is geared towards educators. It is about school leaders, but it really feels like advice for life. Mm. Like mm. if you take teacher out and just put that it in like so hum- <laughs> human being, it's like you want I I want to recognize the humanity in all the people that I come across. I Mm -hmm. want to understand historical truths to be a better person. I think, you know, developing critical consciousness, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Like, that feels really important. Being able to name race and racism where it shows up and work for just systems, that all feels like, like, like human goals. You know, and and it it speaks to me of the power. I mean, it's, it's part of why integrated schools is focused on schools. Is like that work feels really hard to engage in, in particularly in your neighborhood if your neighborhood is mostly all other white folks, or mm-hmm. in at the grocery store. You're like, hang on, how do I stop and think about all of these? You know, like the, the building up the skill set to do it because I think it is a skill set that requires practice, that requires intentionality. Feels hard, but but schools feel like the such this opportunity because we have a kind of contained environment where you actually do we haven't ever done it i think but you could in fact imagine a school system that was doing this every single day Mm -hmm. and imagine what the kids who who got that every day could be like when they were around to you know to to kind of be in charge am i missing something is this like actually life advice hidden as advice for educators For sure. Our, our, our low key goal. Yeah, it's our <laughs> high key goal. Um, I, I'm feeling I've been emotional all day, but I think I'm just I'm just feeling really grateful that you see promise in it as just a human. And I think for me, this is really about how do we reach our, our greatest human potential as educators and schools in the world. And so for you to be able to see yourself in this, even though it was designed specifically for educators, I think we really wanted to be thoughtful about making it something that everyone could plug into and everyone could could be proud to say that they are anti-racist and what that mm-hmm. actually means. So I, I am super honored. Like, that was, that's the best thing you could have said about it. So thank you. 100%. That's great. Do you want to shout out the other folks who worked on it? Oh, my gosh. The crew, as I call them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Listeners will recognize Sarah mm-hmm. Sunling Blackburn, who was on the podcast as well. Yeah. Yes. And then myself and Val. Yep. We, were, we were there. You have Pam Ferrante. We had Josh Parker, who helped us. And then Jackie Rodriguez Vega, Chicago teacher. She was, woo, she brought the fire. Love me some Jackie. I mean, we had, we really did. We had the all-star crew come together and we all have different backgrounds. We all have different experiences. We were a diverse group of people in every way Mm -hmm. you could think. And it was just really cool to collaborate and have all of us kind of just brain dump this vision for anti-racist educators of the future. And it it worked out. I mean, as you said, we created a document for human life. Mm. You know, <laughs> That's such a big yep. deal. Yes, it is. it's huge. Yeah. That's such a big um, deal. So yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, thank you for doing it. Thank you to all of the people who worked on it and for coming on and sharing and for for all you do, Brittany, every day, and and Val, obviously, for showing up here, but also for your professional work because uh, it's yeah, it's important. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. This yeah. was great. Awesome. So Val, what did you think? Man, it was just really good to talk about our work. And um, I'm just thankful to have had Brittany on here and for you to join in. It's just, it's been nice. Yeah, 
She is great. I love the Wisconsin in her and her passion. And she just like, yeah, fully lives into her status as an anti-racist educator. It's awesome. Absolutely. And I think what is really powerful about Brittany's particular story is that she talks very honestly about her own journey being what she would describe as a late one, but then still feeling like she could contribute and add and make change. And I think that's really important for anybody to hear wherever you are on your journey. Yeah. And the idea that, that you can hate school. You can feel like I didn't have the teacher that I needed. And then instead of saying, so school as an institution is out, say like, all right, I'm going to go back now and I'm going to be the teacher that I wish that I had. And I think that also speaks to us not giving up on any child, right? Mm. You know, Brittany talks honestly about that situation with her counselor and how essentially the counselor is like, I don't see the, the path for you that would lead her to where she is today. And so I think it's really important for all of us to recognize the humanity of every single child that's in front of us and to know that there's a future out there that we can't ever anticipate. And so we need to pour into them as much as possible to get them what they need. This is not hard. This is not hard. hard. As a a non-educator, it sounds pretty hard to me. (laughs) You know, what I think about a lot in our conversations is how much of the issues that we have today go back to that first principle, the fact that everyone's humanity and dignity are not affirmed. Because Mm. if they were, then the systems that we created for all kids would show that we valued them in the same way. And so I think one thing that parents in this integrated schools community, they do and can do in enrolling their kids in integrating public schools is declaring that, yeah, every kid has value. And my my kid has value and so do all of the other kids in the school. And yes, we might have fewer resources, but there's still richness here. Mm. And, and I think that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, none of this stuff is simple. None of it fits on a bumper sticker. Mm-hmm. It, there's lots of nuance in all of it. But if there was some kind of, you know, underlying principle that seems to unite at least the people who are involved in this movement, the people who show up to, you know, chapter meetings and book clubs and are part of the leadership team here, it is this this like deep belief that all kids matter, that my kid is special and so are all kids, other kids, that my kid deserves love and so do all other kids. And so, you know, if there is some kind of unifying thing, and and I do think, right, like like we talked about the episode, if if you get that right, so many other things flow from that. So many other things flow from that, right? And I think it's really important for us to, to stay tuned in. One thing that I really appreciated from your comments is that it wasn't just a tool for educators. It was like a tool to be a better human and, you know, just replacing the word educator with human. And that, that made me tear up a little bit because (laughs) that's the goal. Um, That is the goal. And so to be able to provide a resource document framework for anybody to pick up and say, I can, I can do this on my anti-racist journey felt like a huge accomplishment. Yeah. It's a very powerful yeah. document. It's Thank deceptively you. powerful. It like it, you know, it looks pretty simple. You're like, oh yeah, no, that, I can, that all makes sense. And then you read it, you're like, oh wow. Oh wow, yeah. The more you read it, the more I am still shocked at it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm still shocked at how dope it is. So pick it up, y'all. Pick it up. Go get it's it. Free. It's free. But I want to know about your own teaching experience, or maybe even your own children's school experience at this point. How have you seen some of what's in the framework show up? Yeah, I think, you know, I made this point in the episode, like we think of teaching as static that, you know, our Mm -hmm. kids experience is exactly the same as ours. And my kids experience is not at all, Mm -hmm. even in the exact same school with, you know, not vastly different demographics. Like they're having such a different experience than I had. Mm -hmm. I certainly don't remember any conversations in elementary school about race at all. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they were thinking about this. I don't know if they were trying to live out some of these principles on the sly, you know, without Mm -hmm. kind of naming them out loud, which Mm -hmm. feels like much more of what was happening um, Mm -hmm. oh so many years ago. And I want to co-sign that because obviously we didn't create anti-racist education with this document, right? This is based on decades of teacher practice, learning from others, veteran teachers who have been doing this work but didn't have like this exact language for it. You know, we really learned from others and the research about what works for kids. Yeah. My yeah, my kids' experience is so wholly different, and they are they are getting that, yeah, all, all the time. And I, mean, I think the the leader in their building, f- all the way down, it sort of trickles down to to the teachers. There's a lot of intentionality in the building yeah. around anti racism, which I feel very fortunate about. Yeah, I need to shout out my daughter's uh, history teacher 
So one day she jumps in the car and she's like, She's so excited about history class. She talks for 30 minutes straight and she ends with, and that's the impact of imperialism, right? <laughs> and so I'm like, yes. Seventh grade? Yeah. So yeah, I just want to shout out my my daughter's history teacher for embracing those historical truths and like naming them and helping students develop their critical consciousness because now my daughter is seeing all of these connections to the world around her based on the historical truths that she's learning in class. And I think that's right. that makes a huge difference. So can I tell you like the best news that I got this week that I saw this week? Did you see the recent CBS poll? Yes. Okay. For those of you who have not seen the CBS poll, the vast majority of people polled are against book bans. Like 80%. Yes. Across race, across political persuasion, all of it. So exciting. And then 84% of white people saw there was either a major problem or a a minor problem with racism. And so I think we're doing a good job. It felt like a victory to me and it feels like an invitation to bring something like the framework into your school saying, hey, guess what? Most of us here agree that this is how we should treat our kids. So let's figure out how to make this system wide. Yep. Did you, I don't want to like kill your buzz. Oh, no. (laughs) But I I had the same initial reaction to the racism question. Yeah. And then I was like, I think that there's definitely some people in that, yes, it's a problem, who are talking about reverse racism. Uh, there's definitely some white folks who are like, racism is definitely a problem. <laughs> all those all those black people getting jobs that we're supposed to have, all that reverse racism. Man, you always try to just bring me down. <laughs> I mean, yeah, me if too. that's the case, then I'm sorry for those people. But... Even that gives us an opportunity to talk about racism, what it looks like, what it feels like, how it impacts all of us. I think it's still an open door Yeah. that we have to yeah. go through. And that yeah. I think just in, in having these conversations and having the language, we'll figure out how to walk through that door and, and talk the same talk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And a good place to start is bring the framework with you. Because- That's it. Super simple. It's really hard to it's really hard to argue against, and it's really easy to defend what it, we're asking folks to do in that framework. Right. And I think that is something that is key for parents who want to have the conversation. It's really hard to say no. I don't want every child to have a sense of belonging in this school. Right. And if they say that, then please exit immediately and alert right. the authorities. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and there, yeah, there is there's a way also I think that it is somehow simple without losing the the nuance or the complexity. Like it is straightforward. Like you said, it's hard to argue with anything. And I think it also, if you're willing to read it, it quickly disabuses you of these kind of false notions of what you know culturally responsive learning is. Because you're like, oh, it's not affirm the dignity and humanity of only the black kids in the classroom. No, it's affirm the dignity and humanity of everyone. Yep, yep. That sounds pretty good. And in writing it, we really wanted to, and this was on purpose, this was intentional to not center only white people. It was like, how can anyone with any racial identity come to this framework and really say, I have a place to plug in where I can be more Mm anti-racist? Because it's worked for all of us. Well, it's great stuff, Val. It was so fun to get to hear you deep in your field of expertise, sharing your professional work. It's another side of you that has been so nice to get to know as well. Oh, thank you. I'll be back in minivan mode next episode, so don't worry. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. I'll be back. Perfect. I will say we let Brittany off without solving racism. Oh, right? so she's we're trying. gonna have to oh. Yeah, we're gonna have to get somebody next time for, for I that. definitely think our next guest has ideas about solving racism. That's for I sure. Definitely she definitely know. Does. <laughs> I definitely know she does. She definitely does. So now y'all have to listen because I think next episode is when we saw racism. That's the one. So hit that Mm -hmm. follow button. Give us a subscribe. Uh, If you want to help us keep making the podcast, head on over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash integrated schools. Throw a little money our way each month to help cover the cost of making this podcast. We would be very grateful. Yes. Also share broadly, widely. Again, this is a free podcast. Like it doesn't get much better. (laughs) Share with everyone, share with your neighbors, share with your friends, share with your enemies. We want everybody to listen to us. That's right. Well, it's a pleasure to be in this with you, Val. So trying to know better and do better. Until next time, dear friend. It was founded in 20, the years, the years. It was founded in 2020. Yes. One. 
<laughs> it was founded in 2021. Yeah. I think 2021. It says CARE launched in 2021 on the framework Thank document. you. Thank so. you. Thank you. Thank you.